experiment. In an experiment. Okay. We didn't know yet. Why is light so far? Like it sounds so simple. They had no idea. But now the data speak. I find this not only refreshing, but, but at some level astounding. Nature. Welcome back to the Nature Podcast. This week, harnessing the computing power of the strange Skirmian and identifying the X Factor hidden within Zebrafinch songs. I'm Benjamin Thompson. And I'm Nick Petrich Howe. This week in nature, researchers have shown a new way to harness a weird quasi-particle known as a magnetic skirmian, potentially paving the way for the next generation of computing. There is a very pressing need to move beyond conventional computing architectures to avoid an energy crisis. And and skirmian is one of the strong candidates to realize these kinds of technologies. This is Anjan Samunarinian one of the researchers behind the new work. As society uses more and more technology to power things like AI, there's an increasing need for energy. One of the ways researchers are trying to overcome this is by working to develop alternatives to the standard way of computing. For example, brain-inspired computing could be much more energy efficient. Your brain, for example, uses orders of magnitude less energy than a computer doing a similar sort of thing. The brain can do using 20 watts the kind of work that requires thousands of watts of a GPU. Mirroring the way the human brain moves and processes information is something that has been a goal of researchers for a while. But it's very tricky to accomplish as brains store and process information in completely different ways than conventional computers. But one of the things that's shown promise here, at least on paper, is something called a skirmian. These are essentially tiny whirlpools of magnetic spin that behave kind of like particles and so are referred to as quasi-particles. And they have some properties that make them quite attractive to researchers interested in brain-inspired computing. They could, for example, help researchers go beyond the ones and zeros that make up classic computer information. Also, because these skirmians are magnetic, they could work well with some of the current technologies we have in computing, like hard disk drives that use magnets to write ones and zeros onto disks. In order to take advantage of this though, researchers need to come up with a way to easily talk to skirmians, in a similar way to how we access hard disk data in the form of ones and zeros. Currently, researchers use specialised microscopes in the lab to observe these quasi-particles, but this is kind of impractical for computing use. In a real device, you need to talk to the skirmion electrically. So you need to check using currents or voltages that your skirmion is there, you know, your skirmion has moved, and, and so on. So this has been the main roadblock in terms of taking skirmions from an idea to a viable technology is the absence of a device which can detect a single skirmion and tell you where that skirmion is or what it is doing, whether it is there or not, you know, if it is there, how big it is, and also to then be able to write and delete that skirmion in an efficient manner. But Unjin and the team reckon they've found a way to talk to these skirmions electrically. To do it, they tweaked a device known as a magnetic tunnel junction. Now, regular magnetic tunnel junctions are already used in conventional computing in some types of RAM. But Anjan and the team's version is made of the right combinations of materials to enable them to consistently and stably generate skirmions of different sizes. And by applying a voltage to their tunnel, they could talk to their skirmions. Through this, they could control the resistance in the junction and use that to mirror the ones and zeros in normal computer components. Overall, they were able to write, read, and delete data using skirmians. The achievement of read, write, and delete within a commercially compatible device using commercially compatible techniques is kind of the main achievement of our work. 
And there are a couple of added bonuses as well. So uh, one thing is that our device can write and delete skirmions using energies which are a thousand times lower than the state of the art. Using voltage to talk to the skirmions is much more energy efficient than methods that have come before, which have relied on current. The other thing that the team hopes that this will unlock is the ability to go beyond the classic 1 and 0 bits. In this paper, Anjan and the team were able to make skirmions of different sizes, and a larger skirmion or a smaller skirmion in the junction can allow you to get somewhere between a 1 and a 0. Similarly to quantum computing, this allows you to encode more information with just one device. Now, this is all still some way off. As the technology scales up, there's a lot we don't understand. Anjan and the team built their magnetic tunnel junction on a 200mm silicon wafer, like you might see in a conventional semiconductor. But as they scale things up with more and smaller versions of these magnetic tunnel devices, they want to make sure that things stay robust. So if you make a giant 200 millimeter wafer full of uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices, then how robust are these skirmions? What is the variability in their properties? And also, how can we scale this from, in our case, a 300 nanometer device to a smaller device, let's say 100 nanometers or 50 nanometers, and then realize, you know, skirmions that can actually compete with existing technologies beyond just being a proof of concept. Anjan, though, feels like this new paper is a demonstration of the viability of skirmion technology as a way to eventually make brain-inspired computers. And though that may be a long road ahead, he's excited about the destination. At this point, I feel like it's the start of a new journey because uh, I think now that we have told the world that this is possible, we hope that we are starting, you know, a new page for skirmions in terms of looking at them as viable technological candidates instead of just claiming so on paper, right? So I feel that, okay, it's, it's the end of one chapter and the start of uh, hopefully a new and more exciting one. That was Anjan Saminaranyan from the Institute of Materials Research and Engineering and the National University of Singapore in Singapore. To read his paper, look out for a link in the show notes. Coming up, how an AI helped identify the mysterious factor that makes some male zebra finches' song more alluring. Right now, though, it's time for the research highlights with Dan Fox. Deep diving cyborg jellyfish could be used to monitor the oceans. Researchers have already demonstrated that electrodes implanted into live jellyfish could allow for control of the animal's speed and make them swim more efficiently. Now the team want to build on this success to exploit jellyfish's deep diving capabilities. To do this, they built a dome-shaped prosthetic forebody that sits on the bell of a moon jellyfish, making the creature more streamlined. The team showed that the augmented animals could swim four and a half times faster than an unenhanced jellyfish and could also carry cargo such as sensors in the prosthesis. The researchers say that these low-cost enhancements could make ocean monitoring cheap and easy. Take a deep dive into that research in Bioinspiration and Biomimetics. Collective saliva testing could help to achieve universal screening for a common condition in infants. Congenital cytomegalovirus, or CCMV, is a common infection of newborns that can lead to hearing loss and other developmental problems, and usually goes undiagnosed. To tackle this problem, a team of researchers have developed a new cost-saving screening strategy. Healthcare workers collected saliva samples from babies before pooling eight samples together and testing them collectively. If a pool was negative, all its samples were considered negative. If a pool was positive, all samples were tested again individually. Screening was possible with only a fraction of the tests normally needed, and of almost 16,000 babies tested, 54 cases of CCMV were found, most of which would have gone undetected without this universal screening approach. If you're drooling over that research, you can read it in full in Nature Medicine.
I'm going to start our second story today by playing you some very short clips of two male zebra finch songs that have been artificially created by researchers. All I want you to do is consider which one you think is more alluring. Here's the first one. And the second one. Which of the two got you hottest under the collar? Okay, well, admittedly, it's quite hard to tell them apart. In fact, as humans, we can't. But female zebra finches, oh, they certainly can. When researchers gave them the choice, they made a beeline for the first one. But why? Understanding why female zebra finches find one male song more attractive than another is a puzzle that's long stumped researchers. But now a team thinks they figured it out by using artificial intelligence to find the X factor hidden in zebra finch songs. Because, you see, learning songs is one way for male birds to demonstrate their fitness, as Todd Roberts from UT Southwestern Medical Center in the US, one of the authors of this week's paper, explains. We think that this characteristics for vocal learning in songbirds evolved as a fitness signal because it suggests that the animals have time to engage in this learning process when they're young, so they're not having to spend all of their time foraging for food or doing other things that are essential for survival that then they can produce in mating situations or in territorial defense situations when they're adults. Males in about a third of all songbird species stick with a single tune their entire lives. This includes birds like the tiny zebra finch. Males learn a single song during the first three months of their life that they need to learn to imitate from their dad's song. And they practice their song you know, up to 3,000 times a day, slowly modifying it in order to eventually very closely match the song of their father. Which ultimately leads to songs like this. But what is that hidden X factor that makes some songs so attractive? Well, much like human words, zebra finch songs can be broken down into individual syllables, each with their own acoustic properties. But if two male zebra finches both have an equally good song that they've practiced their little hearts out to learn, how does the female decide who's the fittest? People have looked at, perhaps it's the acoustic complexity of the syllables, how noisy the syllable is, or if it's the changes in frequency modulation. So hand-picked acoustic features, and it doesn't necessarily reflect what the female might be tuning into, and it might be a variety of acoustic features. And so it's been very difficult for the field to pinpoint one or two features that might be important. And we wanted an unbiased way of trying to identify what features the females might care about. To do that, the team developed a machine learning system that listened to the calls of multiple male zebra finches' songs and analysed the thousands of repetitions of syllables they contained. Specifically, they compared two groups of birds, those who'd learned to imitate songs from their dads and those who weren't able to and had to improvise them. Females are known to prefer imitated songs, but it's not exactly understood why. These improvised songs, they're usually a little bit noisier, the syllables are a little bit longer, but these are just kind of the things that we perceive. So the team wanted to look at these songs as a whole and see if there was something imperceptible to our ears. And this is where their machine learning system came in. It took all the information contained within each syllable's sound signature and used this to essentially place each syllable as a point on a 2D map. The team then connected the dots between each point and found that the distance between syllables for the birds who'd learned their songs through imitation was statistically larger compared to those who hadn't. This led to us generating a hypothesis that maybe it is the statistical spread of the songs in this two-dimensional space. That could be something that is important. What we wanted to do next was take only learned syllables that a bird produced by imitation, and then see whether or not if we made synthetic songs using only the learned syllables and made ones that were either statistically longer or shorter in this two-dimensional space, whether or not that would be something that the female birds cared about. Which brings us back to... Which has more of the statistical gap and... Which has less of the statistical gap. 
once we started generating some of these synthetic songs and we're playing them back to people in the lab that have a lot of experience listening to songs is that we couldn't tell the difference at all. They all sounded like just a regular learned zebra finch song to our ear. But not to the female zebra finches. To test whether they preferred one over the other, the team put female birds into a tea maze, which, as the name suggests, is a maze in the shape of a tea, where the bird stands at the bottom and must decide which arm of the tea to head towards. A speaker at the end of one arm of the maze played a synthetic song made by sticking together syllables with a long statistical difference between them, while a speaker in the other arm played a song with a short distance. The birds showed a clear preference. In 100% of the instances when we did this experiment, the female birds spent more time in the arm with the long distance song. So it appeared that this difference the machine learning system had uncovered was involved in female preference. But how could it be an indicator of fitness? Well, it turned out that learning a song with this property is hard. The team took males with different statistical differences in their songs, got them to breed and teach their songs to their sons. And what we found was that the sons of dads that had shorter distance songs those birds were able to sing songs as adults that very closely matched the distance of their dad's song and in some instances exceeded the distance. While the young birds of dads that had longer distance songs, those birds, they weren't able to readily match their dad's long distance song, suggesting to us that this is a difficult thing for them to achieve. The team also suggest that because it's difficult, it's special, and a bird has to be fit to learn it meaning this computer-identified X-factor could be an important part of mate selection. Nicole Crianza from Vanderbilt University in the US studies how behaviours that are learnt, such as birdsong, affect things like evolution. She's co-written a News & Views article about the new paper for Nature and was impressed by the method the team developed. I think this paper gave the birdsong field a new computational lens into how to do large-scale analyses of songs in a way that takes aspects of songs that have been traditionally very hard to pull apart from one another and gave kind of a roadmap for how to plot those and visualize them and, and think about them. But the question that I'm sure has come to your mind is, well, what exactly is this X factor? The answer is, it's not exactly clear. This method takes all the info contained within a syllable and transposes it onto a 2D map. Songs with points that are statistically further apart are harder to learn and more attractive to females. But what does statistically further apart mean sonically? It's not abundantly clear, but it's definitely something that's intangible to humans. But that doesn't mean that it's not in there quantitatively, but I don't know what to look for yet. And so thinking about kind of sonically, acoustically, what are the differences that we can point to that give us information about what the female is actually listening for, or what the juvenile bird is actually trying to learn. I think that's the main next step. Answering this question is also key for Todd. In this work, he and his colleagues showed that seemingly all the audio properties commonly used to study birds played a role in statistical distance, suggesting that whatever this X factor is, it's likely a combination of sonic or melodic characteristics that humans just can't pick up on. And there are other questions to answer too. For example, the team showed that this intangible thing, whatever it is, is important in female preference. But it's unknown whether it ultimately results in breeding. Also, is it relevant to other birds? There's a lot to understand, but Todd hopes that their machine learning method, which looks at songs as a whole, rather than focusing on particular characteristics that humans can hear, could help researchers understand how seemingly simple songs that actually hold a wealth of information evolved. We know that sexual selection is a powerful driving force in the evolution of complicated behaviors. But it's been a mystery for a very long time how sexual selection may have been able to drive the evolution of more simple vocalizations. You know, how do, you know, up to a third of this important groups of animals, how did they evolve the types of songs that they evolved? And now we think that we have a first real clue of how this may have worked. Todd Roberts from UT Southwestern Medical Center in the US there. You also heard from Nicole Crianza from Vanderbilt University, also in the US. 
to read Todd's paper and Nicole's News and Views article, head over to the show notes for some links. Finally on the show, it's time for the briefing chat, where we discuss a couple of articles that have been featured in the Nature Briefing. Ben, what have you been reading this week? Well, I've got a story that I've been reading about in Nature, and actually it's another bird-related story, but very, very different to what we've just heard. Now, I've talked about the plight of Antarctic penguins on the pod before, you know, related to climate change and things like that. And there's something else we can add to the list of things that potentially could be threatening them. And it's a deadly strain of bird flu that's been circulating worldwide and now has been found in the Antarctic region too. Oh, crikey. I mean, obviously it sounds like bad news for the penguins, but I guess my first thought is Antarctica is quite far away from most other places. How has bird flu even gotten that far? Yeah, that's a good question. And in particular, we're talking about the H5N1 subtype of avian influenza, okay? Now, this has been spreading around the globe for a while now, and it's caused a huge number of deaths in wild birds. And then I'll answer your question about how it got to Antarctica, because, of course, you're right, it's a very, very remote place. It seems like it's, it's birds coming from South America, migratory birds, potentially spreading it. Now, the virus was first detected in dead birds in the wider Antarctic region in October 2023 okay now these were scavenging seabirds called skewer and some gulls as well okay now this was a sub antarctic region so just outside kind of the main land mass of antarctica itself and sadly this year the virus is known to have spread into other animals too elephant and fur seals albatrosses you know gen 2 penguins and king penguins okay and there was real concern that the virus you know would make its way to antarctica itself where there are of course a huge number of penguins and a huge number of penguin species all potentially vulnerable right okay well obviously if this affects all the penguins in antarctica that would probably be quite bad news so um what's been done to kind of prevent this spread well a lot of this article talks about how research projects have been you know, changed or curtailed or, you know, kind of stopped completely for the time being to try and stop the inadvertent spread of the virus between different animal connollies and also to protect the researchers themselves. For example, the Spanish Antarctic Research Programme was revised for the summer season, which usually runs from October to late March, so, you know, kind of around now, only allowing researchers who specialise in infectious diseases and viruses into areas where animal colonies are, for example. And this has had a knock-on effect to a lot of other researchers who maybe can't go and pick up their probes, for example, and are concerned that their batteries, you know, might run out, so they'll lose a lot of data on animal behaviour and the impacts the animals have on the environment. But other countries are following suit as well. Apparently, Argentine researchers have suspended all activities that had direct contact with animals as well. And this is going to affect researchers studying things like, you know, behaviour and reproduction and so forth. And so when you're reading this article, what's the sort of sense you're getting? Will these measures be enough to sort of stop the spread? Sadly, potentially not. So earlier this year, there was some more dead skua on Antarctica proper which tested positive for the virus. And just yesterday, as we're recording this, a preprint was published, so it's not peer-reviewed there, so bear that in mind, suggesting that researchers had detected this highly pathogenic H5N1 in Adelie penguins. So potentially, you know, really efforts need to be put into working out, you know, how it spread and and, and how far it might travel and, and what impact it might have. Because this virus has had a massive impact on animals across the world. Millions of birds have died and millions more had to be culled as well as a result but also think about the seals as well there has been some mammals that have been affected by h5n1 which is something that that really needs to be monitored you know very closely and the spread of this virus is huge i was reading today about a polar bear in alaska in the arctic circle so literally the other end of the world that had died as a result of an h5n1 infection so there really is a lot to keep an eye on with this story Well, hopefully something can be figured out because I think these animals are already quite vulnerable. So having another pressure on them probably isn't good news. And my story is like sort of kind of related to that in a way that, you know, poultry often is a way that bird flu is spread. And this is a way to maybe avoid using poultry altogether. So this is a story that I was reading about in Scientific American about how maybe we should be farming snakes. I've heard about snakes being farmed to harvest venom to make, you know, anti-venoms and stuff. But this is farming for 
food. Yeah, yes, for food. So I think it's fair to say that meat has quite a big environmental impact. Now, the caveat to that is it depends what kind of meat. Replace all your beef with chicken and you're going to be doing less damage to the environment. And these researchers have proposed that maybe actually we should be looking to snakes for meat instead as because they reckon and they've done a paper to sort of analyse this, that farming snakes would be a lot less damaging to the environment. Right, because I guess there's a lot of chat about, you know, moving to an insect based diet because the protein to resource kind of differential is much more favorable because they're small and and you can get a lot of protein is that kind of the same thing with snakes yeah that's kind of the same thing because like insects snakes can't regulate their own body temperature like you and i can and when you're farming something that's a big waste of energy those animals like using their energy to keep themselves warm how dare they where snakes don't do any of that which makes them much more efficient at turning their food into meat so one of the stats that they came up with in this paper was that to get a cow ready for eating to get beef you need to give the cow 10 times as much food by weight as the cow itself weighs whereas for a snake you only need 1.2 times as much food so using a lot less resources to farm the snake in the first place and a lot of it is to do with them just being a lot more efficient and also not wasting their energy heating themselves and what sort of snakes in particular you know could this hypothetically be used for? So in the paper, they looked at reticulated pythons and Burmese pythons. So you're right, not every kind of snake would be useful for this. Some snakes are just very small and wouldn't give you very much meat and it probably wouldn't be worth your time farming them. These are quite big snakes and they're snakes that people already eat in many parts of the world. So in those parts of the world, people may be more accepting of them as well. Because a big question mark about this would be whether people would want to eat snakes. And maybe in parts of the world where you and I live, people are less familiar with that. So they might not be as keen on that. But in many parts of the world, it's pretty normal. And as you say, like this isn't without precedent around the world. But is this just a kind of hypothetical or a thought experiment? Or do you think this is something that the researchers actually think is potentially a a real goer. The researchers propose it, but there are some things to take into consideration. So some other researchers were interviewed for this article and some other articles that I read about this. And one of the key things is that we don't really know a lot of the wider environmental impacts of snake farming. So Things like cows and chickens and stuff, there's been a lot of research done to understand what the impacts are of those kinds of farming. But for snakes, we don't really know. And one key thing may be what you're feeding the snakes. So snakes are carnivores, and so they're eating meat and that meat that they're eating has come from animals which have eaten plants so that is something that wasn't really captured by this current analysis and so could make the environmental impacts a lot larger when you take that into consideration another thing to think about as well is that humans don't tend to eat predators very much because you know they accumulate a lot of toxins, they accumulate a lot of things because they eat lots of animals which have eaten lots of things. Da, 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 da. Things build up through those sort of trophic levels and end up being not great for you. So it's unclear exactly how that would play out as well. And as you scale something up for like wide scale farming as well, it sort of changes the maths a bit because at the moment these snakes are being fed sort of waste meat that wouldn't be used for anything else anyway. But if you're trying to do this on a big scale, you may have to produce the meat to give to the snakes, which then may have a lot more environmental impact. So there are a lot of questions to answer with this one, but it's an interesting idea and you know it sort of highlights the different ways we need to think about how we need to eat in order to make sure everyone has the correct nutrition without destroying the planet. I can't believe you brushed over the word scales there, Nick, with, with bare, uh, barely a look to the camera. <laughs> I didn't even twig that one at all. <laughs> anyway, let's leave it there for this week's briefing chat fascinating story that one no doubt and listeners for more on these stories check out the show notes for some links and for a link where you can sign up to the nature briefing and get even more stories like them delivered directly to your inbox and speaking of inboxes if you have anything that you want to tell us or let us know about the show please do send your comments to at nature podcast on x or to podcast at nature.com i'm nick petrichow and i'm benjamin thompson thanks for listening